Lift up your heads to the coming King, bow before him and adore him, sing. To his majesty let your praises be, pure and holy, giving glory to the King of kings. Listen as the choir sings, lift up your heads. Thank you, choir. We're excited as the choir gets worked up for uh, Christmas cantata, and uh, we love hearing from them regularly. So uh, it was a blessing to start our service out today with them. It's good to see you this morning. When you came in, you should have been given a bulletin. If you didn't get one of those, we can get you one. They've got some in the back, but uh, take a look through your bulletin, see what's going on. We don't want you to miss out on the many upcoming activities and events. I uh, want to keep you updated on all of that, so look through there and see what's going on. Uh, guests, we are extremely grateful for your presence, thankful that God has brought you into our fellowship, and we look forward to getting to know you better. 
And uh, if you would do us a favor, there is a connection card attached to that bulletin. If you'd take a minute, perforated, tears off fairly easy. Fill that out. Let us know you're here this morning. If you'd like some information about the church or to sign up for some of the activities, you can do that with that connection card. Also on the back of that card, there is a place for prayer requests. We'd encourage you, if there's anything that we can be praying about for you, for friends, for family, uh, if you would share that with us, we will be faithful to lift those requests to the Lord and look forward to his answer to those as well. So uh, we invite you to just fill that out. Later in our service, we'll be taking up our morning offering. That's a time when our members give their tithes and offerings to support the ministries here at First Baptist. And if you're a guest with us, we would encourage you to worship with us during that time by giving us an offering of yourself, placing that connection card in the offering plate as it comes by. We would be grateful. I hope you came this morning ready to engage with what God has to share with us. He has something specific for you today. Know that. God loves you, and he's got plans for you, and uh, his intention is to speak directly to you this morning through song, through testimony, through words, through his word as it is proclaimed. So I hope you're ready for all of that and that you will just prepare your hearts for that now. Let's begin with a word of prayer, if we would. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of worship and the opportunity just to gather together in your presence. Lord, we ask that you would just clear our hearts and minds of all the distractions of the day and of, of life right now because you have the answers that we need desperately. And so, Lord, just help us to, to stop. Stop the busyness. Stop the go, go, go for just a few minutes and give that time completely and totally to you here now, that you would be able to show us a little bit more about who you are and a little bit more about who we are. Help us also to see the potential of the days ahead and what you desire to do in and through our lives. Lord, you have the seat of honor this morning. This isn't about us. We have come to lift your name and to worship you. And so we ask right now that you would just uh, draw us into your presence. You are an amazing God, and we love you. Find us faithful as we worship and praise you now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike? Let's stand together as we sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful that my soul shall ever be. How 
I'm reading from Philippians this morning, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being very, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This next song may not be very familiar, some of you, but it's called At the Name of Jesus, and that takes the very words that we just read, some of those words, and uh, puts them to song. So let's we'll sing together. At the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus,
had to rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your the power to say but your name Dear Lord, and Father, we just thank you for this time of season, dear Lord. As we go through the changes, and we know that you just love us, dear Lord. I pray for our preacher as he brings us today's message. I ask you that you just bless these tithes and offerings, dear Lord. Thank you for the staff in this church and this beautiful place that we have here to come and just glorify you and learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. If you remember when we began this series, we talked about how names meant much. 
the meaning of names and the, the, the desire to give certain names and the power behind the names. Well, this morning is the epitome of that. This name that is, is his most well-known name. It is the name Jesus. Jesus, which means Savior, Rescuer, Deliverer. Jesus, the name above all names. And so as we, as we consider this morning the name of Jesus, I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew begins his gospel with the ledger of the genealogy of his chosen from Abraham to Jesus, the Messiah. We pick up Matthew's account in verse 18 as he tells us the story of the time for heaven to return to earth. If you remember, in the beginning, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked daily with them. And yet their choice, their choice set us on a journey where God still wanted to be involved with his creation. God still guided and directed. But God didn't walk daily in the garden with them. Matthew gives us this account of heaven returning to earth as Jesus serves as the Messiah. And we pick up the account in verse 18 as he tells the story. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father God, this morning our desire is to hear from you clearly. As we have been discussing the names of Jesus, Today we come to the most powerful one of all, the one that means the most. Lord, help us to understand the power behind this name. Help us to understand what power is at work within our lives because of this name. Lord, each and every one of us here today, any that may be watching us from home, are in a position where you desire to work in our lives. You desire to do something powerful in our lives. But it all comes through the name of Jesus. For it is Jesus alone who saves, as we sang about this morning. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment and understanding now. Give us insight into who you've called us to be and what you desire us to do even now. And be glorified as we continue to worship you through your word now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I want to draw your attention to a few things that come out of this passage. And the first thing that it is important for us to recognize is this is a heaven-sent name. This isn't a name that Mary and Joseph decided to come up with. This isn't a, a name of heritage. You know, my, my name is William Isaac Isaacson. My father's name is William Isaac Isaacson. My great uncle's name is William Isaac Isaacson. My great uncle was finished having children by the time my grandpa began having children, and my great uncle did not have any boys. So the name didn't get passed on until my dad was born. And uh, so my grandfather continued the name on. Uh, it, it's, it's from a Finnish tradition of the Isaac son. Somewhere back, if, if I trace it back, I, I have an ancestor whose first name was Isaac. Actually, it was Isaac Williamson uh, because his father was a William because that's the way they handed the names down. Um, but then when they, when they got to America, uh, they kind of settled in and, and the name gets passed down. Um, Dad's, never, Dad's never given me a hard time about it, but I broke the name up and uh, uh, two of my boys have, have William and Isaac in their middle names uh, to, to keep the lineage going, but uh, I broke the tradition. Who would figure? Uh, but Jesus, Jesus was not named because he had a grandfather or a great-grandfather or a grand, great uncle named Jesus. This name came directly from God. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and told him, now, there's a lot going on in Joseph's life in this moment when he gets this message. After all, he's, he's met the love of his life, beautiful young woman named Mary, and decided to make her his wife. They have been betrothed. They have been committed to one another. They're getting ready to start their life together and start a family. And she ends up pregnant. Now, he knows it isn't his, there's no possibility of that because it says right here that Joseph was a righteous man. He had not known Mary in that way. So what's a man to think? What is the process that goes through his head? Being a righteous man and being a good man, Joseph had the choice and he chose to just quietly put Mary aside, not to make a big deal of it. Now, there's going to be a big deal. They've been promised to one another. They have made that commitment. They have begun that process. And when it changes and when he's no longer getting married to her, everybody's going to want to ask why. What happened? Well, the easiest thing was she got pregnant. Don't know who's but that's not what Joseph was going to do because Joseph was a good man. He didn't want to, to shame Mary. Whether there was any shame there or not in his, he didn't know yet, but, but he was not going to shame her in that situation. He was just going to quietly end this all. And God sent a messenger. What's the message? Well, the message is this. Joseph, go ahead and marry her because the child she is carrying is of the Holy Spirit. Huh? What do you mean? Well, just trust me. Go with it. In addition to having to deal with this whole idea which this is a miracle, right? We talked about miracles in youth this morning a little bit and how Jesus revealed who he is through the miracles that he performed. Well, here's one that started it off. You've got a virgin who's pregnant. 
had never happened before. It isn't going to happen again. This isn't, this isn't a repetitive miracle that God is going to use. This is a one time because this is his son. And so Joseph's trying to process all of that. And oh, by the way, when he's born, name him Jesus. I don't think that would have been the greatest concern that Joseph had at that moment. But the reason for naming him is also mentioned. Because he says that the angel of the Lord says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Savior, Rescuer, Deliverer. Now, the Old Testament, just, just as a side note here, this was not an uncommon name. In the Old Testament, they would have, they would have referred to him as Yeshua, Joshua. It was a common name. But you'll notice that Jesus is not a very common name today. Why? Well, because of this baby. Because what he has done. He changed the picture of this name. He fulfilled it, the Savior, Rescuer, Deliverer. He fulfilled it to a point that no one else will ever be able to live up to. And so it's not a common name given today. The second thing I draw your attention to, though, is it is a name with a mission. It's a name with a mission. Very clearly, the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph and told him, here's the mission, here's, here's what it is. He will save his people from their sins. Now, I want you to understand a couple things here, and, and this is where we need to engage a little bit here this morning with this name of Jesus. There was a main mission. The main mission was to rescue us from our sin. That was the main mission of Jesus. He was given that name. He was sent to earth. God in the flesh. With the primary main mission to rescue us from our sin. That's where it all begins. But it isn't where it ends. Because the good news continues to be good news even after he rescues us from our sin because he had a secondary mission. And that was to give us full and abundant life now. I have come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. See, somehow along the line, we, we have failed to represent this well. Some people who sit in churches every Sunday morning, who have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, some people just have a sour face, like they've been sucking on lemon drops. And they're missing out on this abundant life. They're missing out on the joy and the wonderful blessings that God has. You know, folks, in, in all reality, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we ought to be rays of sunshine everywhere we go. When, when we walk out those doors this morning, the outside ought to perk up. Because Jesus just didn't come to rescue us from our sin, but he came to give us a full and abundant life. And it's time we start looking like we're living one. I know life can be hard. I know it can be challenging. There's a lot of things going on. Believe me, I understand. But you know what? The life that God has for you and I 
as followers of Jesus is a good life. It's a secure life. And it ought to be reflected in us. It ought to be reflected on your face. In fact, I challenge you, when you get home, go look in the mirror. See what you see when you look in that mirror. Does it look like somebody who's living a full life in Jesus? In Mark 2, there's a story of a healing of the paralytic brought to Jesus. He's brought by four friends. And I want, I want you to catch something that happens. It, it, most of you know this story, but let me just, let me just share it with you. Out of, uh, I'm not going to read it out of Mark 10, but I'm just going to uh, tell you the story. Jesus is, is teaching. He's in a house, and there are so many people there that there are people hanging out the windows, standing in the doorways, kind of trying to listen at the windows. There's no room inside. The place is packed. But there's one man who has been lame, who has four special friends, who pick up his mat and carry him to the house where Jesus is teaching because they have heard that Jesus has the ability to heal. And they love their friend so much that they're going to take him to Jesus because they believe Jesus can do something. They get there. There's no room. Not only can they not get to the front of the room where Jesus is teaching, they can't get in the door, let alone to the door. There's just a crowd of people surrounding this house. There's nothing they can do. They could have put the sour face on and gone back home. Well, we tried. But not these four friends. These four friends were committed. They believed Jesus could do something. And they cared about their friend so much that they took him up on top of the house, probably in an adobe-type building, flat roof. They used that for extra living space. Stairs went up on the outside. So they climbed up on the roof. I'm sure the homeowner really appreciated what happened next because they began digging a hole in the roof. And, and it wasn't just a, a little peephole. I mean, I don't know how tall their friend was laying on that mat. I mean, I'm six foot. If it's me laying on that mat, I'm six foot high, luckily not quite six foot wide. They got to dig a pretty big hole to get me down through. And understand, they're not going to tie me to this mat and put me vertical and lower me through a little hole like this. They're going to dig out a six-foot hole that's probably two to three foot wide and lower me down vertical. No, horizontal. With all four corners lowering me down. They go to all that effort because there's a man inside named Jesus. They lower him down. I'm sure the people inside were very upset, especially the ones directly under the hole because they're probably dusting dirt out of their hair. I'm sure that all of the chunks didn't come up. Some of the chunks probably fell down. You see a commotion going on and everybody's looking up. And now here comes this pallet. What do they think they're doing? Hey, I'm down here. They lower him on down. All right, I'm getting out of the way. There he is laying right in front of Jesus. Do you know the first thing Jesus says to him in Mark chapter 2? 
Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, in, in, in that moment, many of the religious leaders got all worked up. What do you mean his sins are forgiven? No one can forgive sins but God alone. Well, you're right on that. Now think about it and figure it out. But they get all worked up. I wonder what the four friends on the roof were thinking when they heard that. Well, we didn't bring him up here and lower him down there so you could forgive his sins. We brought him up here so you could make him walk. Jesus knew what the people in the room were thinking. And so he said, which is easier for me to say your sins are forgiven, which no evidence is going to come of that, or to say get up and walk and take your pallet and go home? but so that you know that the Son of God has the authority to forgive sins. I say to you, get up, take your pallet, and go home. And the man did. Now, why do I share that story with you? I share that story with you because Jesus came with a main mission to rescue us from our sin. And that's what he did. Before he healed the man, it was more important that he be forgiven his sins. That was primary. Even though the four friends were looking for a physical healing, salvation comes first. Every single time. So, as we consider the fact that he is heaven-sent, given a name from heaven, and he came with a mission, we need to consider our relation, relation to the name. Our relation. What is your relation to this name, Jesus? Well, there's three things I want you to consider about that. The first one is, first is salvation by his name. We have to deal with sin. Sin comes in a variety of, of uh, manners. We have sins of commission. We have sins of omission. You know, the difference is the, one, the sins we commit or, the, or as James says, for him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, it is sin. That's omission. When you don't do what you're supposed to do. That's sin. It's not just a choice, it's sin. We need to first deal with sin. Now, a lot of people today would like to deal with that abundant life part, would like to deal with everything that Jesus offers. You know, I want to see some miracles. I want God to heal my body. I want God to heal my family's body or my friend's body. I want, I want to see those miracles happen. But Jesus had a primary mission, and we need to understand that in our relation to this name, it begins with salvation by his name. If we don't deal with sin, you can stop right there. There is no other relation with this name, Jesus. Without salvation, there is no other relation to this name, Jesus. After salvation, then we get the second aspect. Only then can we experience abundant life. The blessings of belonging, being a part of God's family. See, you're not going to experience the blessings. You're not going to experience the abundant and full life if you don't get the salvation first. It doesn't work that way. Jesus didn't come to, to hand out all the blessings without salvation. It doesn't work. First, you have to deal with the sin. Then you can experience the abundant life. You know, a lot of times in life, we like to, we like to try and deal with the symptoms going on. We get a lot of that in our benevolent needs here at the church. 
we'll get folks coming in saying they need help paying this bill. We have, we have several churches in our community that help in different ways. We've got a church with a food pantry, and we've got a, a, some churches that will help with, with rent and stuff. We tend to focus on, on bills, electricity, and, and water, and things like that a lot. And our deacons do a great job of overseeing that. And Mary does an excellent job of being that initial face that these people who need help, um, the first face that they see and they deal with. But you know, a lot of them are coming in here, and, and I haven't had to deal with the benevolent ministry as much here. I, I help out with that, and I'll talk with people from time to time. But, but in the past, I've had to do a lot more of that. And it's amazing to me that I will find people who come walking into the church and say, well, you're supposed to do this for me because that's what the church is about. And they think that we're, because we have the name of, of Jesus with us, that we're just supposed to take care of them because that's what the church is, is all about. Well, that's not where it starts. It starts with salvation. Now, we do help folks out from time to time with the intention of opening the door of salvation because that's the primary mission. And we need to remember that. You know, those of you who, who have beautiful yards, my, mine isn't so beautiful. Um, mine survives. It, it gets green once the summer gets going a little bit more, and, and a lot of the green is, is not grass. I'll just be honest. Uh, if, if I were to uh, put too much weed and feed on there, um, I'd need a whole lot of grass seed to take up the dead space. Um, so I, I, I'm careful with that. But you know those dandelions and those little weeds? You can keep mowing them and mowing them and mowing them. They're not going anywhere. You're just cutting off the symptoms. And until you get to the root, nothing's going to change. And it's the same way with these people who come in for benevolent needs. And it's the same way with people who, who come and want, want Jesus to just bless their lives and take care of them and perform a miracle or something for them. Until they get to the root of the problem, which is sin, nothing's going to change. The weed's going to come back up. The sin is going to rear its ugly head time and time again. we got to take care of the sin first. Only then will we have an abundant and full life. So the third part of this relation to the name involves accessing the power of the name. And that's what I want you to, to grasp this morning. Hopefully you have salvation taken care of. Hopefully you have called upon the name of Jesus and believed in who he is. But accessing the power of the name, here's the deal. You need legitimate, legitimate permission to use the name. A lot of people use the name of Jesus. Walk down the, the halls of, of the school You'll hear the name of Jesus. You'll hear God, Jesus. Walk through the halls of our government offices. You're, you're liable to hear the name Jesus. But they don't know him. It just comes out. And, and, and honestly, a lot of people who use Jesus' name in vain, if you stop them right after they use it and say, excuse me, what did you just say? What do you mean, what did I just say? Well, whose name were you invoking? I wasn't invoking anybody's name. What are you talking about? They don't even know they're doing it. But there's no power in his name when they call it out. They're not expecting any power because they don't know him. But to use Jesus' name in accessing the power, we need legitimate permission. 
How do we get that? Well, first, through forgiveness. As we already mentioned, it begins with our salvation. To access the power of the name, you need forgiveness. You need your sins completely forgiven you. And that only happens by believing in who Jesus is. That he is the Son of God. That he lived a sinless life. That he was born of a virgin. That he died on the cross to pay for your sin so you wouldn't have to. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb and on the third day conquered even death, the greatest miracle of all time, and was raised and is alive. If you believe that, if you choose to receive that gift, that free gift of mercy and grace, that takes away your sin, you are forgiven. And that's the first step to accessing His power in His name. The second step is abiding in Him. John chapter 15 is a great passage for you to read through about abiding in Christ. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. It shall be given unto you. Ask anything in my name, and it will be given to you. See, it's all about his name. But you got to have permission to use it. you got to know him. Abiding in him means living in him. It means the things that you do on a daily basis relate to him. You don't go through your life outside of Sunday morning and just forget all about him. You don't go to work with with no thought of Jesus. You don't go to school with no thought of Jesus. You You don't do your yard work with no thought of Jesus. Abiding in Him means everywhere you go, everything you do, you consider who Jesus is in your life and how it affects what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. That's what it means to abide in Him, to live with Him in you. that you're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price. Being forgiven and abiding in Him, only then do we receive, well, here's, here's a term that most of us can relate to. That's when you and I receive the power of attorney. Do you know what a power of attorney is? We, we use it, we, we talk about it, uh, especially as our, as our families get older. Uh, we give someone power of attorney over, over our affairs. It means that they have the power to use your name in your place. It means they can go to the bank and access your bank account. It means they can talk to the doctor and make decisions for you. It means they can take care of your bills. It means they can choose what's going to happen with your things. They have power of attorney. They get to use your name in your place. Do you realize that when you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you abide in Him, you're given power of attorney to use His name and the power that comes along with it? Not very many of us take advantage of that. But a lot of us try and do it out of order. We try and and get access to that power without gaining first the salvation and then abiding in Him. There's an example of that in Acts chapter 19. Paul has been called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He is going from town to town and sharing the good news, seeing people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, encouraging them to abide and access this power that the name of Jesus can afford in their lives. He's been doing that a lot, and and people are witnessing that. You see, that's I go back to that that sour lemon drop face. Uh, When you go out into the community with that type of a face, you don't don't really exude any confidence that uh, you've got power through the name of Jesus. It's more like life's getting the better of you rather than you getting the better of life. But these people were watching as, as Paul would heal people. 
he would pray over them and in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He would sing praises and, and pray while he was in prison and the, the shackles would fall off and the doors would swing open. He would cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They had witnessed this and they saw and watched. And so they tried to do it themselves. And the account in, in Acts chapter 19 is, is about some individuals who, who come across someone with a demon possession. And they try and, and use the name of Jesus. And while we're at it, we'll include Paul because Paul's been, been healing people and, and, and using the name of Jesus as well. And, and so in the name of Paul and in the name of Jesus, I, I command you to come out of that. Demon looks at him and through the, the person he's possessing and just looks at them and says, well, you know what? I, I know Jesus. I know all about him. And I even know about Paul. But who do you think you are? I don't know you. And what's more, Jesus doesn't know you. You don't have the power of attorney. They jumped him, beat him, stripped him down. You can't use it out of order. If you're not abiding in Christ, following your salvation, you don't have the power of attorney to wield the power that is at hand in the name of Jesus. I want you to turn to one passage here with me, if you would. John chapter 14. And I want to remind you of this. It's something you know already, but John chapter 14, verses 13, 14, and 15 I want us to look at this and read it. Listen to what it says. Follow along. It says, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Folks, that's to you. That's for you and I. The power of Jesus' name has the ability to free you for all eternity from the power of sin. One of those two powers is at work in your life right now. Right this moment, one of those two powers is at work controlling your life, either the power of sin or the power of the name of Jesus. Which is it? But it goes beyond that. Once you overcome the power of sin by the name of Jesus, you got to choose what you're going to do with it. See, his name also has the authority to give you victory in every situation that you face right now. The name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with right now. In your life, the name of Jesus has the power to give you victory. Mike read the passage from Philippians chapter 2. And there will be a time, there will be a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess his name, the name of Jesus. But you know, some of those some of those are going to be confessing that in an eternal separation from God. Only then will they come to realize what they should have done while their heart was still beating. But it's too late. It won't matter how big or how powerful, powerful or how influential you are. There will be a day when you will bow and you will confess who Jesus is. Now, many people, they're, they're just set determined in stone that they will not do that, and they probably won't in this lifetime. 
Many will not. Many have not. But I will tell you they are now. Those who have gone on, they're realizing it would have been better to confess now. Because while they're confessing who Jesus is, while they know who Jesus is, while they are bowed to who Jesus is now, they're also separated for all of eternity in a place called hell. It's too late for any benefit for that bowing and confessing for them. It's not for you. It's not for us. It's not for our friends and it's not for our family yet. They have the opportunity. And you have the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. Some of us have gotten in the habit of, of getting a little, forgive me, a little lax in our understanding of prayer to the point where our prayer may say, hey, God, you know, I really need this. Or, God, can you help me with that? And we're forgetting something. What did John 14 say? If you ask anything in my name. See, while I've got the power of attorney, I don't have the authority and power myself. I don't get to say, I know Jesus, and I've got the power of attorney for Jesus, so therefore, I command this to happen. No, that doesn't work that way. I ask for it in the name of Jesus, by the name of Jesus. There are times when I get bold in my prayer life, and I will say, by the power of Jesus. Fairly regularly in my personal prayer life, especially on Sunday mornings, I will, right before I come in here, by the power of Jesus, Satan, I bind you and remove you from this place. you got no business here. It's not by my power. It's by the power of the name of Jesus that that can happen. And they're alone. We need to remember our prayers need to be through the name of Jesus, not thinking that we've suddenly become something. We're not all that. Jesus alone is. How's the victory going in your life? How are you dealing with the Monday through Saturdays? Is this the extent of your abiding in Christ? If I don't abide... If you abide in me and I abide in you, that's what Jesus says. You will bear much fruit. You want to know why you're not bearing much fruit? Because you're not abiding in him. And you know what happens when you don't bear much fruit? Jesus said, my father is the husbandman. Any branch that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. They're withered. Men gather them together and they're tossed in the fire. You know what? The Bible says it. Sometimes we forget it. Some of us are only going to enter as charred remains into eternity because we will be tried by fire. And the fruit of your life will last. But if you ain't got no fruit, you're not taking much with you. Salvation was not the end. It was the beginning of life. And we need to start living like it, and we need to start living in His power in the power of the name of Jesus. Let me just close with this. God sent Jesus to address sin, not to make you feel comfortable in it. I look at where we are today. I look at where we are as a community. I look at where we are as a state. I look at where we are as a nation. I look at where we are in the world. And the sad state of affairs is we got a whole lot of people who claim the name of Jesus for salvation. But they've gotten way too comfortable in their sin. 
and they think they're okay there. That's not abiding in Christ. And that will not give you the power of the name of Jesus to be at work in your life. Where are you this morning? You know, normally I encourage you to pray for the people around you. Pray for those who you may know that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and, and I want you to do that, but this morning I want you to think about yourself a little bit too. I want you to think about the victories or the losses and the defeats that you're having in your life and why. Some of you here this morning do need that salvation. Jesus, the power of the name of Jesus isn't going to do anything in your life until you go ahead and make that step of faith to believe Jesus is the one who paid for your sins so you don't have to and that he will give you eternal life and that he will give you an abundant and full life now. Some of you need to make that decision. You've been holding off long enough. You've been dancing around it for years. It's time to take a step of faith, to pray, to ask Jesus to come into your life, to forgive your sins, and be your Lord and Savior. And until you do that, nothing's going to change. But there's a whole lot more of you in here who have made that decision that need to decide whether or not the power of the name of Jesus is going to be at work in your life or not. That falls on you and what you're doing with it. Are you abiding in him? Are you executing the power of attorney that he has given to those who abide in him? Are you living like you have a full and abundant life? Because that's what he promised. It wasn't a maybe, it was a promise. If you will abide in him, he will give you a full and abundant life. He came first and foremost to save us from our sins, but he also came to give us a full and abundant life. You need them both. It's time to step up. Pray with me, would you? Father God, Lord, you have provided all that we need. You have shown us. You have revealed yourself to us. You have proven yourself faithful time and time again. You fulfill all of your promises. But so many of those are dependent upon what we choose to do with them. And it begins with admitting that we're a sinner and asking for forgiveness and receiving the salvation that you alone can give. And so I pray that, that some of us here this morning would go ahead and take that step of faith and quit waiting. But Lord, you also promised an abundant and full life if we would abide in you, that we would bear much fruit. Lord, it's time for a little bit of fruit inspection on our own lives. It's time for us to determine whether or not we're living in the power of the name of Jesus or just getting by. And it's time to take some action. It's time to be determined in what you desire to do in our lives. And so right now, Lord, receive our worship in response to you as we decide right now what we're going to do with what we've heard. What are we going to do with these words? What are we going to do with the name Jesus? Is it going to be more than just salvation? May your spirit move among us and move us to action now. And may you receive all the glory, honor, and praise for what we choose to do in this moment. And forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, if we fall short in this moment of worshiping you. We pray these things 
in the powerful, unlimited name of Jesus, our Savior, Deliverer, Rescuer. By the power of the name of Jesus, we ask it now. Make it so. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. You have the only choice left. What will you do with what God has said to you this morning? The altar is open. A couple of our deacons will be here at the front. If you need somebody to pray with you, we're here. If you have questions, if you want to, if you want to come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if it's time to take that step of faith this morning, I encourage you, step out and come. We're here to help you. We're here to celebrate with you in all of that. Will you respond to him today? As we sing this hymn of invitation, you choose what you're going to do in worship of him today. I have decided to follow I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, just a
Here's what's happening in the weeks to come. Uh, poinsettias, don't forget about the order form in your bulletin there. Uh, please drop that off by next Sunday. Uh, they're due by the 30th, which I think is the day after that, I think. Yep, Monday. Yep, on Monday. So get those in. Uh, trunk or treats coming up pretty quick. October 31st from five to seven. We still need volunteers to help um, pass out candy and provide cars, trunks for that. And then uh, also workers to, to uh, help with uh, hot dogs and drinks, things like that. So, and also candy, there's boxes you'll find around different places of the church. So if you can help with that, that would be great. Uh, Fellowship of the Saints happening um, on November 2nd, uh, having uh, just a Thanksgiving service and time of fellowship there at noon. And Trevor and Emily Darr is coming on November 3rd through the 5th, uh, coming in view of a call for associate pastor of youth. There'll be more times and events about that weekend coming up. There'll probably be a, a fellowship, a meet and greet time probably on Saturday, but that more of that will be coming uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, so be in prayer for that important decision uh, for the life of our church. And lastly, uh, the youth on uh, November 6th. Yeah, could find the time there. <laughs> <laughs> Can't see where it's at. Uh, on uh, mo Monday, November 6th, going to the trampoline park. So jumping for joy. That's it. All right. Uh, we will get more information out, but please do be in prayer uh, that weekend. Uh, we will br be bringing the DARS in. We will want you to meet with them and, and come and visit with them a little bit, get to know them. Um, and uh, then he will be preaching that Sunday morning. So um, please make an effort as we get the schedule out, as we get that put together and get it out to you all. Uh, please, please continue to be in prayer, but please also get involved. Uh, this, this is the place God has brought you to be a part of the family here. And so his plans and intentions include you and your witness of, of what he's wanting to do. So please plan on that. Set that weekend aside and plan on being a part of the things that are going on that weekend. All right. Patrick's going to come and close us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing a chorus to finish our service out. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this day, for the words that you've spoken to us through Pastor Willie. And uh, Father, I just pray that you open our hearts and minds to uh, really do what you want us to do, to go out and be a light to the world, to shine your light that you've given us. Father, we want the world to know you as we do. We love you so much. Uh, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. It's in Jesus Christ's wonderful name I pray. Amen. Have a great week.